industry on parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Grand Central Aircraft Corporation at Tucson, Arizona. A huge place employing 4,000 aircraft workers. And yet this plant doesn't manufacture a single plane. The reason is that Grand Central is one of the firms designated by the Air Force to modify, fit out, and test planes produced elsewhere. In this case, the powerful B-47 jet bombers turned out by Boeing. For a plane like the B-47, there are literally hundreds of miles of blueprints. And since the Air Force never stops making improvements and changes, new blueprints are being added constantly. A jet bomber has more than half a million parts, so these too must be kept in stock. Why here and not at Wichita at the Boeing plant? Well, if the Wichita assembly line were stopped every time they made a modification, mighty few planes would ever get into the air. So they send the finished ships here for the modifications and the installation of kits that prepare them for combat duty. Some of the work is on the electrical system. Many of the duties of the nine-man crews of much smaller bombers used in World War II are handled electrically in this plane, and the crew has been reduced to only three men. But you can imagine how much more complex this makes the wiring job. Here comes one of the gun mounts for the tail turret. Because of the climate down here in the Sunshine Country, 75% of the work can be done outdoors. The canopy is not to ward off rain, but to keep the sun from making it impossible to work inside the plane. It's here that the Air Force gives the planes some of their final inspections before accepting them. More than 10,000 inspections are made on each plane. Still ahead is another test of how all the parts of the ship will function in actual flight. The B-47 requires more than a mile for a takeoff, and Tucson has one of the few airport runways in the country long enough to accommodate it. B-47, product of the teamwork between industry and the armed forces, helping to give us dominance in the air. America's new frontiers are pushed back every day somewhere in this country through research. Each year, industry spends more than a billion dollars in research to discover new products or improve those already on the market. These new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. But more important, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater chance for better living for everybody. This can happen only in America where industry is free to experiment, where men know they can refuse to accept limitation where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. Industry on Parade turns its cameras on itself to show how one film program for television is produced. Here in the New York office of G.W. Johnstone, radio and television director for the National Association of Manufacturers, a story conference is in progress. A New Jersey firm has been suggested for coverage, and Johnstone and his staff discussed the idea with the NAM regional manager. In most cases, this would be done by phone or letter, but since this story is in the New York area, they can confer with regional manager Harry Buck in person. With the idea accepted, newsreel editor Roger Young outlines it to NBC Television News, whose personnel will follow through with the actual coverage of the story. Writer-director Arthur Lodge gets the facts. The story concerns a company whose chairman of the board is convinced that a factory can and should be as pleasant as a worker's home. A date is set and a camera crew arrives to take the films. Although this story happens to be near New York headquarters, Industry on Parade 
using the services of the most extensive film news organization anywhere, goes behind the scenes in factories in all corners of the nation. A camera crew consists of at least four men and many pounds of equipment. Since the program went on the air, these men who record the industrial aspects of life in America have been in every imaginable type of factory. They've been in coal mines, salt mines, iron mines, in helicopters, submarines, jet airplanes, in the forests and on the Great Lakes. Everywhere that people make news simply by doing their jobs. Like the many people whose activities he films, cameraman Jess Sabin is a craftsman who knows his job well and enjoys it. The film he shoots, when returned to New York and developed, gets a preliminary screening under a unique method that permits viewing in several widely scattered points in the city simultaneously, all linked by a closed system television circuit. Then the film editors take over. 10, 15, 20 minutes or more of film must be cut down to perhaps two minutes of running time while maintaining the continuity and, if possible, without sacrificing any of the essentials. All the bits and pieces are spliced together in a pattern that we hope will tell a coherent story. The spliced film is measured foot by foot as a scene list is prepared for the benefit of the writer. Motion picture film runs through a projector at an unvarying rate. 24 pictures a second, no more, no less. The script must fit, or the narrator will be talking about one thing while something entirely different is on the screen. The recording session. As the complete film for one program is run off, the voices of the narrators, the background music, and the sound effects are mixed and recorded to create a soundtrack. The narrators sit out here in a miniature motion picture theater all by themselves, while the technicians work in a soundproof control room behind them, as well as in other rooms on floors above and below. The blend of sounds goes first to a magnetic tape recorder before being transferred to film. Picture and soundtrack return to the laboratory where prints are prepared for each of the television stations that carry industry on parade. In the third year of the program, the 18,500 companies that make up the National Association of Manufacturers have found increasing evidence of the widespread interest in how we Americans go about our business. We build not only structures such as these in which men and women of the future will work, but also the pattern of society in which they will work. Not only frameworks of stone and steel, but frameworks of ideas and ideals. The words of Robert Wood Johnson, board chairman of Johnson & Johnson of New Brunswick, New Jersey, manufacturers of surgical dressings and allied products. This is the sort of factory that's resulted from that philosophy. Bright with sunshine and recessed fluorescent lighting, air conditioned throughout, pleasantly decorated and furnished. Quiet, simple, efficient. Each of the company's plants turns out just one line of closely related products. Here, it's preparations like baby oil. The goal is to have everyone in the plant thoroughly familiar with all phases of production from raw material to final use by the customer. And the amazing machines for mixing, bottling, capping, labeling, and packing are the servants, not the masters. While the emphasis is on the best of working conditions, the modern factory also has up-to-date facilities for the employee's other needs. A worker puts in almost as many waking hours at his place of employment as he does in his own home. Modern management seeks to make those hours as pleasant as they are productive, increasing our standard of living on the job as well as off. Factory of the future? That label is no longer strictly true. For while it points the way ahead, in growing numbers, the factories of the future are the factories of today.
By unity and teamwork, a free people built America into the greatest nation in the world in the shortest possible span of time. To 156 million Americans, it has meant higher wages, shorter working hours, more and better products, and a living standard which has never ceased to climb. And by unity and teamwork, we can solve many of the problems facing us today. We can accomplish it by concentrating on unity and teamwork between nations, between industry and government, between management and labor, and between industry and the great American public. This can and must be done if each of us in America wants to strengthen and improve our way of life. Ask a down easter to name a sporting goods company, and chances are that like hunters, campers, and fishermen anywhere, he'll mention L.L. Bean of Freeport, Maine. Among the many and varied items in the company's line are fishing flies, and these are some of the raw materials from which those flies are painstakingly assembled. Feathers, fur, and fabric, brilliantly colored or drab, depending on what attracts the eye and appetite of the breed of fish you're after. Here we see the preparation of a Judge Palmer fly, designed to be used for fishing the bottoms of ponds or deep pools. It's made of material that will sink readily and made to resemble the sort of fauna that might be found creeping slowly along down where the really big trout are feeding. Artificial flies were used for fishing in Europe at least 500 years ago, and new variations have probably been developed every year since. Leon L. Bean, the man who, very logically, built a sporting goods business bang in the middle of a region where sporting goods are so widely used, is proud of the skills of his hundred or more employees. Here's one such employee preparing the cork for a cork body fly, a lure designed for bass, perch, trout, bluegills, and crappies. It'll be pulled through the water with short jerking motions, and it'll look for all the world like a good fish dinner, or should we say, a good dinner for a fish. And this sure-fingered miss is assembling a fly known as the Gray Ghost. With the hook secured in the vise, fur from the tail of a buck deer goes on. Then trim made of feathers from the golden pheasant, silver pheasant, and peacock. The different flies have names as fancy as racehorses. This tiny specimen is called simply the Montreal, but others bear such labels as Bolshevik, Silver Doctor, Royal Coachman, Parmacheni Bell, and Mickey Finn. And a fly's size bears no relation to the length of its title. But to a fisherman, the name is only an identification, and all that matters is, will it bring in the fish? Fly makers, like other manufacturers, keep close tabs on the success of their products, and when reports from lake and stream indicate a model isn't working out as well as expected, they soon replace it with one that will. <laughs> 